First of all, I will just stop, pick up one or two of the words which Jonathan's mentioned. He's mentioned sun a few times, and he's shade and, uh, and fire and whatnot. So uh, the word for sun is going. And by the way, you are supposed to uh, be part of this. We're about reawakening the Sydney language. So I want to hear you say going. Thank you. Going is the sun. And the fire is guiyang. Guiyang. And they're rather similar, aren't they? Guiyang and going. In fact, they might well have been the same word. So the, 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 the sun in the sky might have been perceived by the Aboriginal people as a fire in the sky. So it's all part of the Aboriginal worldview, you might say. So guiyang and guiyang and uh, guing, uh, the same thing, really. And bawa is where you are, like to be, that's the shade. So you've moved into the shade, and this wasn't part of my prepared talk, but there you go, you're in the, bawa is in the shade. So that's where you are now. And um, what I hope to do is to run through a few little sections of this talk, and I'll tell you what they are, and then we'll run into them. So we first, we're going to do a bit of a welcome, and we had a welcome before, but that's what we'll do. And then we'll talk about the first records of Australian languages made, and then the recording of the Sydney language by the first fleeters and so on. And then my own personal rediscovery of this, because that's why I'm here, I suppose, to try and tell you that. And, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about languages in Australia, and Jonathan mentioned 250 of them. And then we'll go on to the reawakening side of things. So that's where we are, and I need your help. So what was that word for sun? You've forgotten already, haven't you? Gooing. And I've got to tell you, there will be an examination at the end of this talk, so you better start remembering these words because you're going to be examined on them at 15 words at the end. So you learn them, okay? This is it. Now, there you are comfortably sitting on these chairs and looking at the horizon over there, and what you can see are those tall buildings. But you wouldn't have been able to see them if this thing with the white outline was here, still up. Well, there you go. And that was a bit of guiyong, oh, guiyong that uh, took care of that. That was the fire that burnt that huge building down. That I think it was designed by James Barnett. Um, so this huge garden palace uh, building was burnt down, and that was a great loss to Sydney. And so we got no buildings in the backyard there, in, in the background. And that's what you've got to imagine. In 1788, it was like that. Where we are in the Botanic Garden here is a bit like it might have been in uh, 1788, with just trees and grass and so on, uh, and no great European buildings. So you've got to imagine th that time right now, there are no buildings there, none of this uh, Garden Palace building either, just trees and bush and so on, and a few Aboriginal people walking by, and in particular, three I will just mention by name. There's a fellow called Colby, and a young fellow called Nanbury, and a third called Gurui. But there were lots more, who we'll mention in a moment, but these three that I've just mentioned were members of the Kadigal people. The Kadigal people, they were survivors of the Kadigal clan in 1788. Well, just after 1788, in about 1790 we're talking about here. So those three, Colby, Nanbury, and Gurui. And they are, on their behalf, I will attempt a welcome to country for you, and with the, their permission, I hope. And the, uh, country, the welcome to country could go somewhat like this. I hope you're listening, because this may be part of the exam. Di ngora gadagal ngai. Di means this. Ngora, that's the word I want you to remember. Say it. Ngora. It begins with NG. It's very difficult for Europeans to say because we have lots of NG words in our, in our language, like singing. There's two of them in singing, but none that begin with it. Ngora means country, camp, or place. So here we are in this Ngora. Di Ngoragu. The, well, the, the, the welcome to country is Gui Ngoragu. Gui is the bush call that you hear. You shout in the bush. Kui, okay? Gui. It's a Sydney language word and used by some other languages as well. Gui. Say it, please. Gui. It means basically come, but we're doing it for welcome today. Gui ngoragu. So the, the gu bit on the end of ngora is a, a suffix, an ending, which means to. It's a bit like Latin. If any of you studied Latin, they had endings in Latin. And Sydney language and Aboriginal languages work on suffixes or endings. So ngoragu is to land, country, or camp. So gui, ngoragu, is to uh, 
uh, to the country camp or land. So Guiyong Gorugu is welcome to country. And the welcome to country is Di Ngora Gadigal Ngai. Gadigal, di, this camp of the, the, the Ngai on the, on, on the end of Gadigal is of Gadigal Ngai. So this is uh, the land of the Gadigal people. Baya Bawi, Nini Nini, Mile Yagu. Baya Bawi, that means they say. They say, nini nini. We don't know the word for you all, you all here. We just know the word for thou, which is the you singular, which is nini. Say that one, nini. Another one of them is ng words. There's millions of them, nini. So I've just used two of them. Nini nini meaning a lot of you, okay? Mile yagu. Mile means stranger. You might have heard the word mile, the Mile Creek massacre and so on. Mile is a stranger. Yagu or yaguna means now or today. So, Baya Bawi Nini Nini Maya Yagu is, they say that you are strangers today. So, that's what they say about you mob. They say you're strangers today. Like you mob are strangers here, okay? Maya Bial Mulnau is the third and last part of this little welcome to country. But, stranger, not tomorrow. So, the welcome to country is to say, they say you're strangers now, but you're not a stranger tomorrow. In other words, welcome. So that is a little welcome to country which I devised. So mile means what? Stranger. Stranger, thank you. That's part of the exam. You'll find it at the end. Bial is a very important word, and it means no. Funnily enough, bial, they pretty quickly found out the word for no. This is the first fleet, as I'm telling you about here. They almost never found out the word for yes. It's funny that uh, the word for no in uh, Aboriginal languages is very plain and easy to identify, uh, but yes is much harder to come upon. Mulnaul is the word for morning, okay, like tomorrow morning, okay. So, baya bawi nini nini maya yago. I'm not asking you to say that one, but it is means they say, you all are a stranger today, but mayal bial mulnaul, you're not a stranger tomorrow. Okay. What was the word for stranger? Oh, great. That's fantastic. Mulnaw is morning. Okay. Now, this language, you just heard, if Benelong happened to walk past here now, I'm not sure whether he would have understood that, uh, trend, that uh, welcome to country which I made up then. Uh, I'm hoping he would recognize some of the words and might even be able to get the drift of it. I hope he would. Anyway, uh, that would be nice. But um, the language that we've just put in the air here, was spoken here for thousands of years. Thousands. Long, long time. Actually, um, if the Sydney people were here for, say, 60,000 years, 40, 50s, anyway, an immense time, they probably weren't right here. Because we're, we're talking here about the Ice Age. The Ice Age, think 10,000 years for the Ice Age. Think 60, 50, 60,000 years for Aboriginal people in this country. So 10,000 is much more recent than 60. So where were the Sydney people 10,000 years ago, before the Ice Age? Well, they were probably what is now out to sea, because the seas were much lower then, because the, uh, we had ice piled up on the continental land masses. And where did that ice come from? Well, it came from the sea. It was water that was in the sea, came down as snow and became ice and piled up on the continents, and so sea levels were lower. And so the Sydney people would have been out on the coast. They're coastal people. So they wouldn't have been here. This was a drowned valley, the, the, uh, where the Sydney Harbour is now. It was just a valley, okay? You could have walked in it. But uh, so when the sea levels rose, when the ice went back in the, into the water, into the oceans and so on, sea levels rose. So that's a part of the story which you don't think of very often. And so Australia was, uh, was bigger in those days because the land masses were not covered by um, water because they were, the ice was piled on the continents. Anyway, that's a little story. So the words I want you to remember on this first page I'm on here are Ngura, which we've done quite well, and Ngurugu. Ngini was meant what? You, didn't it? You singular. And I used nini nini for you all, okay? But nini is you singular. Yagu, does anybody remember? We've got a suburb called Yag Yaguna. Remember that? Yaguna? Anyway, Yagu means now or today. Bial. Thank you. Somebody, it, it, usually when you get a crowd, somebody remembers. And I think I heard one or two Bials mean no. No, okay, Bial no. 
And one or two others which we might mention here because of the place we're in, which is the uh, Botanic Garden, is Moro, is a path. So we've got lots of paths. There's one over there. Okay, that's Moro, is a path. In Bimal is what you're all sitting on. Not, I'm talking, not talking about the rugs. I'm talking about the earth, Bimal. You might have heard this fellow called Pemowe. Pemowe is an Aboriginal hero, basically, a Sydney Aboriginal hero and uh, a resistance leader. But anyway, so his name comes from Bimal, which means earth or ground. Bamuru is what some of you might be sitting on, getting a bit wet, is the grass, Bamuru. And the last one I want you to mention on this page is Badu, which is water. Badu, water that you might drink. There's a distinction between oceans and water you might drink out of a cup. Okay, Badu is, uh, we're not quite sure whether it's not Bardu, Bardu with an R in it. Uh, it's one or the other, Badu. I, I, I'm going for Badu, because Mr. Dawes wrote it down as Badu. We might come on to Mr. Dawes later. So we'll test you again. What's the word for path? Thank you. Muru is path. Muru is path. Bimal, earth or ground. And Bamuru was grass. You don't have to remember that one, but the most important one here is Badu, which is water that you might drink. I'm about to turn this page, so get ready for it. So we've done that first page, and that was the kind of welcome to country part. And the welcome to country, you remember, was Gui Murugu. We're going to get on now to the first recorded words, and it's a bit interesting after that uh, welcome to country, uh, the Gui Murugu, which is, you know, we're nice to see you mob here, because the very first words that the first fleeters heard from the Aboriginal people were, I wonder if anybody knows. Yeah, well, I didn't quite catch that, but it might have been uh, something, but it, the very first words they heard were wara wara, wara wara, or sometimes wara 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 said rather aggressively, wara, wara, wara. And that means, go away. Or, in the uh, vernacular, bugger off. Okay, so they saw these people arriving on their ships and, and uh, looking, and uh, I don't know what, they were arriving. And that was the, the words were shouted everywhere at them, wara, wara. Hardly a welcome to country, was it? No, it wasn't, it was quite the reverse. So the, the Aboriginal people weren't all that thrilled to see the Europeans turn up in their ships. So they weren't welcome, they were quite the reverse. But wara wara is interesting because it does sort of give the idea of, of what I mentioned before about suffixes or endings. And wa itself, by the way, many of these things have multiple uses, but wa in this particular case suggests movement. And the ra of wara suggests urgency and away. So wara, wara is kind of move away. Wara, like wari is also part of the Aboriginal language. Wari is just, the re part of it is the same without the urgency. So wari just kind of means away, like that person over there is wari, just distant, okay? Wari is away, but wara is away, you know, buzz off, okay? Wara. So wara wara is just an emphatic firm form of that. So that was in, in about 1788 that this was recorded in Sydney. But the first words that were recorded at all by Europeans ever, as far as I know, were recorded by William Dampier on uh, the privateer in the Western Australia. And in 1688, he recorded in his journal words, Gurry Gurry. In, this was in King Sound in Western Australia, which is up in the Kimberley region. Gurry Gurry, without any translation as to what it meant, but I wouldn't mind betting it meant much the same as Wara Wara. Uh, I don't know, but we, we just, uh, he just heard these words. And then he, he went away and he came back 11 years later on a second voyage, or I think it was a second voyage, um, and he uh, heard these words, boo, 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 boo. And I think it might have been a challenge. That, uh, you know, I, I don't know what it was. There was, again, no translation of what boo, boo, boo meant, but it might have been some kind of challenge because, like, you know, the, the Europeans coming up, and I think they were the scoffing, rather, the Aboriginal people at the Europeans, and they said, oh, boo, 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 like almost like poo, poo, you know. Oh, we don't think much of you. Um, and this was at Dirk, Dirk Hartog Island near Carnarvon uh, in the Gascoigne region of Western Australia. So that was in the 17, uh, 1600s, late 1600s, 1688 and 1699. The next recordings were made by James Cook. This was in 1770. So we're talking about a century later, basically. 17th century, uh, 1770, James Cook on his, the Endeavour 
you, uh, on that great world journey that he took at that time, and uh, it ran into the Barrier Reef. This was after experiencing uh, time here in Sydney. Went up there on the, and of course they didn't know about the Barrier Reef, and they ran into the Barrier Reef and uh, got uh, the ship got a hole in it, and they were stuck in the Barrier Reef with a, a hole in it, and. Uh, I must wonder how, if any of you were ship's captains, how would you get yourself out of that predicament? So there they were on the barrier reef, quite some distance from uh, the coast, and uh, they had this ship with a hole in it, and they had uh, about 10,000 miles, 15,000 kilometres thereabouts from uh, London, and, uh, and they must be wondering how they were going to kind of survive. Well, what do they do? I suppose you all know. Anyway, uh, I think what th they, there was a few measures that they took. This is not part of the language, but it's a good story anyway, that... Uh, they um, chucked the guns overboard. There were, the boat had about six big, heavy cannons on it. So they chucked them overboard. That lightened the ship a bit. And then they waited for the tide to come up, and they dragged ship's sails underneath the boat. Must have been quite something to do. And then finally, it was raised over the, uh, off the rocks, and they were able to limp to the shore. That's the, uh, the, main, the, the coast. And uh, into what uh, became the Endeavour River. And while they were there, uh, and, and Captain Cook said to the carpenters, carpenters, fix this boat, please. And uh, so they set about fixing the boat, took them a while to do. And uh, while they were there for a number of weeks, they ran into some Aboriginal people, and Cook made a collection of words of about, I think, 40 in a word list, but not included in the word list, but separately recorded in his journal, was the word kangaroo, gangaroo. That's an interesting word itself, because they probably heard gangaroo and if I said to you, kangaroo, did you say to me, did you say kangaroo or kangaroo? And I say something in between, kangaroo. Oh, well, they wrote down this word, K-A-N-G-A-R-O-O, something like that. And of course, when they got to London and showed this list of words, and uh, people in England read this and said, oh, this is, this is kangaroo. <laughs> but it was actually kangaroo. Gangaroo, the word up there. Anyway, the next recording I'd like to tell you about was in 1793. This was after the first fleet landed in, uh, in Sydney, but 1793, and this was in Tasmania uh, by the, uh, the French. And they were on a couple of boats, the Esperance and the Recherche, and they were looking the, uh, for uh, La Perouse. La Perouse, I don't know if you know the story of La Perouse. We've got this suburb in Sydney called La Perouse. And uh, while the first fleet landed in Botany Bay with Captain Philip and the 11 ships of the First Fleet. They were there, and they're only there for a couple of days, and they looked out to sea through the heads of Botany Bay, and there were a couple of ships, that, well, ships that they could see on the horizon. This was amazing. This went like uh, if um, Armstrong was walking around on the moon, you remember all that, and saw a few other fellas walking around on the moon. It was, it was, it was as surprising as that. Anyway, this was uh, La Perouse, and La Perouse was, um, was searching for... Uh, that, that was last Perouse, and he eventually got lost, never seen again. And so they, uh, the French set out this party to, um, to, to find La Perouse and in these two boats, the Recherche and the Espérance, and they went to Tasmania, and they recorded some words there. And one of these words was kangaroo. It's extraordinary, isn't it? So was kangaroo a Tasmanian word, or was it, as Captain Cook found out, was from Cooktown, way, 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 dozens and dozens of language groups away from there. And of course, I think it was uh, a corruption of the re records. Somebody had been to Tasmania, had mentioned the, this for a European, had mentioned this word kangaroo, the Aboriginals had meant, uh, remembered it, and when the, the French came again, they, uh, they re recited it back to the, uh, the newcomers. The, uh, it, it may have come from uh, an exploratory expedition to Tasmania in 1772. But it's a pro the process of contamination of the records, which I'm trying to draw to your attention here. Anyway, those are the, um, the, the early records I'm going to talk about. And I want you to remember from this particular page on this, the words wada wada. Say it. And what does it mean? Go away. That's right. Hardly welcome to country. All right. Now I just want to tell you about the beginnings of the study of the Sydney language here in Sydney, when the first fleet arrived, and so on. In the early days of the colony, in 1788, they arrived on uh, 26th of January. Uh, but that was in Sydney, but they arrived a little earlier in Botany Bay. When they got to Botany Bay, by the way, um, 
Captain Philip had a look round and uh, didn't think much of it, uh, Botany Bay. Uh, the Captain Cook and Banks had written in fairly glowing terms about the wonderful pastures and, and the things of Botany Bay, and that's why they went there. But um, Captain Philip didn't uh, think much of the place, and so he said to uh, Captain Hunter of the Sirius, I think we'd better go and check out that other place which uh, Captain Cook mentioned, um, just up the coast a bit. And so Captain Hunter said, all right. And so Captain uh, Philip said, well, get out the longboat and we'll uh, go up there and have a look. And so they got the longboat. Can you imagine rowing a boat from Botany Bay to Sydney Harbour? I mean, they were superheroes, these guys, these uh, sailors in the past. They thought nothing of it, apparently. So they uh, must have started off pretty early in the morning and got in their longboat and just rowed from Botany Bay all on the ocean out there and all up into Sydney Harbour and uh, turned into it. That Captain Cook didn't come here. He saw it from the outside and just uh, recorded it. And so they came into Botany Bay, in, into uh, Sydney Cove, and uh, had a bit of a look round. And they went from bay to bay and... Uh, one of them recorded, it was uh, Philip, I think, recorded that uh, this uh, harbour was so marvellous, a, a thousand ship of the line could reside in it. Ship of the line, these are great warships. Ship of the line could reside in it with the most perfect security. And as we all know, it's one of the, well, the possibly the most marvellous harbour in the world. Then we've got another good one, about equally good, just up at the Hawkesbury. I mean, Hawkesbury would have done fine also. We, we're just so privileged here in, uh, in Sydney. Anyway, that's the story of arriving in Sydney. So they arrived on the... Um, they all moved up here. All the 11 boats arrived in Sydney uh, and were here by about the uh, 26th of January. And they began to set up camp here, uh, right in Sydney, much to the dismay, I'm sure, of the Aboriginals shouting warra warra at them all the time. There was little language process progress in that... Uh, those first months. Um, they were just here, they were well aware of the Aboriginal people and uh, Governor Philip, he was governor by this time, he was most concerned to try to learn, you know, to make contact with the Aboriginal people and uh, so that they could, you know, deal with them, to understand them, to try to let them understand that uh, they weren't going to do them any harm and that sort of thing. And uh, the way Governor Philip resolved it, he set about capturing one of them. Not a very good thing to do, not very humanitarian, but they captured one of them on the 25th, on the 30th of December, 1788. This is the end of the first year. They managed to capture one of them whose name was Arabanu. 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 They captured Arabanu. And uh, interesting actually about Arabanu, that's what they, he said uh, his name was, um, Arabanu. No words in the uh, Aboriginal languages by, by and large for the most part, begin with, with a vowel. So it couldn't have been Arabanu to begin with. I think it was Ngara, Ngarabanu. It was probably Ngarabuni. So if I say, what's your name? And, and if I say to you people in English, what's your name? And you have no clue what I'm talking about because you speak Sydney language. I say, what's your name? And look quizzically, quizzically at you. And you might reply to me, Ngarabuni. Ngarabuni. And Ngara is to hear, think, listen, or understand, okay, ngara. You can, might as well, this is not in part of the exam, but we, you can learn this one now, ngara. Bit like ngura, it's not ngura, it's ngara. Ngara, hear, think, listen, or so all to do with the mind, right, ngara. And buni is a suffix meaning lacking. So what he was saying, I think th what this guy was saying when he was asked his name was ngara buni. I don't know what you're talking about, understand lacking, ngara buni. And it was recorded that that was his name, Arabanu, Arabanu. So that's pretty funny, isn't it? So that, um, that's how... Anyway, that fellow, poor old Arabanu, was, uh, was captured in, uh, on the 30th of December, 1788. And um, this is where the next event in uh, Sydney takes place in this period. I'm jumping a moment. Because the smallpox hit Sydney, the Sydney people, in April 1789. So he was captured... In, on the 30th of December, 1788, and smallpox befell the Aboriginal community in Sydney in April 1789, okay? All of a sudden, smallpox broke out in Sydney. None of the newcomers got smallpox, not one of them. None of the people on the First Fleet. By the way, by this time, I told you 11 ships came, all, uh, all of them except two left. They were hired ships and they brought the people and the, the stores. They all left. 
leaving two boats, the Sirius and the Supply. Anyway, we, we just, so those are the two boats left. Anyway, and none of the people who are brought on, uh, the, none of these convicts, none of the sailors, none of the military people, not one of them got smallpox, but the Aboriginal people got it in droves, got it in droves and died like, well, the proverbial. So that was unbelievably tragic. You might think of the stolen generations as pretty bad, but the smallpox hitting Sydney in the uh, first year of the whites arriving was, well, unimaginable. Well, there we go. So the smallpox came. Arabanu, of course, died of it. Arabanu died in the, on the 18th of May, 1789, just a few weeks after the smallpox started. So that left them without an informant. It was pretty tragic for Ar Arabanu, tragic for everybody. And so eventually, Governor Phillip thought, we'd better capture some more. So he sent out uh, uh, the party to, um, to capture some more, and they went out to Manly this time, and they went there on the 25th of November, 1789, the end of the second year, okay, and they managed to capture two. It was a terrible commission that uh, these sailors had to do for, for um, Governor Phillip, and they recorded it, I think, Bradley, after whom Bradley's head, he said it was one of the, about the worst thing he'd ever had to do when under orders to capture these people. Anyway, he captured two of them, Colby and Benelong. Colby and Benelong. Well, there you go. So they, they, they brought them in. They thought they were going to be eaten or killed or something like that. It was just absolutely dreadful. And but anyway, they, they were brought to, um, to the town here in Sydney. And Colby, he was the older by about uh, 12 years, I think. He managed to escape within a week. He was tied with a rope tether. He managed to slip it off his, um, his ankle, I think, and nicked off. But uh, Benelong wasn't so lucky. But Benelong eventually escaped on the 3rd of May, six months later, 1790. But he was there for a good long time. Now, the, the 3rd of May, 1790, is an important date, only because of the next sequence. Because on the 7th of September that year, 1790, Governor Philip was speared at Manly. Benelong, by this time, was away, and, uh, and th he wasn't... I mean, they, they'd befriended Benelong by this time, and so on, so they sort of knew him, and uh, they ran into him from time to time, and a whale had been washed up in Manly, and Philip was invited to go along and see this whale and, and so on, so he went to Manly, and during this uh, uh, meeting with the Aboriginal people at Manly, uh, there was a moment, and uh, Philip was speared in the shoulder by a fellow called... Willimering. You don't have to remember that either. But anyway, that was the event that happened. He was speared in his shoulder, it came out the back. It was a terrible moment for Philip and terrible moment for everybody and quite dramatic. And uh, they tried to escape uh, by running back to the boats and so on. And a great long spear st sticking out the front and jabbing into the ground as he ran along. And uh, one of the soldiers tried to uh, break it off and while it was sticking in his shoulder. Just imagine, it was an absolutely terrible moment. Anyway, they managed to to get to the, the, the boat and get aboard and manage to row to Sydney with a spear in uh, Philip's shoulder all the way. And Balmain, Surgeon Balmain, after whom the suburb of Balmain is named, managed to eventually get it out. And Philip managed to recover in the uh, weeks and months after that. Anyway, that was on the um, 7th of September, 1790. And it's interesting to note that only a month or so after that, um, it's recorded that the Aboriginal people who had kept away up until that time thronged the camp, thronged the camp. So that for whatever reason, maybe this spearing um, might have been some sort of retribution uh, being applied by the Aboriginal people. Might have been, we don't really know. But after that, retribution was paid and they started to come into the camp. For whatever reason, maybe they thought they could get provisions from the camp. Who knows what? But they started suddenly to come into the camp, and they were everywhere, and it was possible for the Europeans to have contact with them and hence to learn them. This was recorded, by the way, by Watkin Tench, one of the people. If you haven't ever read about the First Fleet days, Watkin Tench writes the most readable account um, of the early days, and he was a captain of the Marines. So that was in 1790. And the, the next thing, the next date I want you to remember is in 1800, a fellow called Bungaree. He was an Aboriginal person from the Hawkesbury region who came into the Sydney area uh, at that time with his people. And Bungaree spoke a different language. Now, you've got to remember, 
the number of people we're talking about who used to live here is very tiny. I mean, you mob here would be about a sixth of the people who are estimated to live in the Sydney region at the time, okay? Uh, because Governor Phillip was required to make a report to London, and he estimated there were about 1,500 Aboriginal people in the Sydney region at the time, okay? So when they, so many of them died from the smallpox, that numbers were diminished hugely. And we'll just go back. I mentioned those three people who uh, uh, were rem the remainder of the Cardigal clan. It is estimated that these clans, I mean, you've got language groups consisted of clans, like subgroups, and the, these clans were thought to number about 50 people. In other words, a small number of family groups. And uh, of the Cardigal clan, it is estimated, well, if there were 50 of them, three survived. So that's a pretty high fatality rate. It was obviously a not a viable clan group at the end of that. So, um, so they had to merge. So the whole breakdown of the society took place following the smallpox. And Bungary came in with his language and began the supplanting of the Sydney language at that time. Well, I can tell you that what the whites, the Europeans, discovered at this time were that in, in Australia there were many languages, not just the one that they first supposed. They first supposed that the, the, the word list obtained from uh, James Cook, from um, Cooktown, would be useful in Sydney. But of course it wasn't. It was many, many, many language groups away. And so there was basically nothing, almost nothing, in that word list which was of use in Sydney. Then they discovered that, um, we know when with the, that they discovered that there was another language spoken on the Hunter River, which is very close to Sydney. Another language altogether. And you couldn't understand it. The local people couldn't understand this word on the Hunter River. And then they discovered that there was dialectical differences between the language spoken here in Sydney, where the harbour is, and what they called inland. And we're not talking about Alice Springs here. We're talking about Parramatta. That was inland. So Parramatta and uh, Penrith and the Blue Mountains was inland. And so that there were dialectical differences between the Sydney language here in Sydney and as close as, um, as uh, Parramatta and uh, Penrith. Now, I just want to mention here some of the people who recorded these languages in the First Fleet days. Of the, the most notable of these was this fellow called William Dawes. And he was, a, he was one of the Marines. They weren't Royal Marines in those days. They were just Marines. And the Marines were, basi were basically, as Marine word suggests, they were soldiers on ships. That's what, they were kind of the, the military people who are on ships, the naval armed forces. And Dawes was a second lieutenant, which is a junior officer of Marines. He was a scholar. He was possibly the most scholarly person on the First Fleet. And really, the sort of person he was, was an engineer. He was a problem solver. He was a problem solver, but he had a number of other talents, uh, like he knew French, apart from anything else. And uh, well, that was William Dawes. And he recorded the, uh, the first language. He was asked by the Astronomer Royal, by the way, before he left England, because he was an engineer and he had an interest in uh, astronomy, to look out for an ex expected comet. And he was provided with telescopes and a small canvas observatory to set up. And that's what Dawes did when, did when he arrived. He set up this uh, observatory at uh, Dawes Point. Dawes Point, but interestingly, name, his, interesting enough, his name remains, though he himself called it after the uh, Astronomer Royal, whose name was Maskeline, Neville Maskeline. He called it Maskeline Point, but it became to be known as Dawes Point. And while he was there, he lived there, and he was, uh, the Aboriginal people used to visit him in his hut. And he had the idea of writing down what they said. So he wrote down not just words, but small sentences. So Dawes is the hero of this story because we learn more about the Aboriginal language of Sydney from Dawes by far than anyone else. Others were a fellow called David Collins, another was Watkin Tench I've mentioned to you, and another was uh, Southwell. Southwell was mate on the Sirius. Tench was captain of Marines and Collins was a legal man, judge advocate and effectively secretary to, um, to uh, Governor Phillip. Another guy was called Daniel Payne. He arrived in 1795 later on, and a few others uh, called uh, Brown and Cunningham, Bowman and Lang, 
also made records, which we needn't go into. The last um, speaker of the Sydney language, or last couple of speakers, was a, a fellow called Rickety Dick. That was because he wasn't a very, very good at walking. He, he must have had some pretty good illnesses. And he died in 1857. And there was another guy called Wingle. Uh, I know nothing about Wingle, but he died round about the same time. And these were the last speakers uh, of the Sydney language. But I personally think the language had pretty well gone by about 1825. In a generation, the Sydney language had gone, and it was the first language to be overwhelmed, to my knowledge, by the European arrival. And this happened time and time again across the country. The o Aboriginal languages were overwhelmed and lost. The word for smallpox, and this is to, to be remembered, was galgala. Galgala. Interestingly enough, they had a word for the smallpox. Maybe it was just a scratches. I don't know what it was. But the, this is the word they, the Aboriginal people used for smallpox, galgala. So that's the end of that page. And we're going to go on now, jumping ahead a long way in time. Basically, from 1788, 17, well, the languages were recorded in 1790, 1791. Those early First Fleet days is when these main records of the Sydney language was, were made. And so we're now going to jump right away, virtually to the present day. And I am here because I've been invited, and it's my privilege to have been invited here. But to, this is partly the story of me and so on, and how I came upon these languages. And anybody of you could have done this too. So. We have those uh, First Fleet accounts, and uh, the single advantage I have over the Aboriginal people, uh, the, the people who recorded these languages in 1790, is a computer. We have modern-day computers, and you can record these languages on computers, and with these computers, you can sort and sift and organize the records. And I eventually did that by um, reading the First Fleet accounts and so on, and writing down the words I came upon, and. Uh, and eventually wrote them on, uh, on, in the computer with a database. Well, um, I'm jumping around here a little bit, but the computers, I started off with a little old uh, TRS-80 Tandy computer in the early days of computers. It's funny, really, computers have only been with us, you know, since about uh, the time I arrived in Sydney in uh, 1969. And, uh, and so all the whole computer story has developed since then. So that's what happened then. And uh, the, so computers have now gone from that early tandies and so on, and I now have a very flash Macintosh, um, which is, is very nice to use. And of course, there are other computers as well, but I just happen to use that one. And I've had about 10 over the years. I've gone from one to another. I also ran into a fellow called Keith Smith, who will be talking to here tomorrow. Uh, and he is uh, very knowledgeable on Aboriginal people. And he was kind enough to find in the library, you can just see it over there, that sandstone building over the trees there is the Mitchell Library the biggest and best collection of uh, Australiana in the country, I think, in the Mitchell Library over there. And Keith Smith uncovered lots and lots of vocabularies in that library and passed them on to me, and I eventually put them onto my computer. And at the same time, I found out that uh, these records by William Dawes, that marine on the uh, First Fleet, were held in a couple of little notebooks. And they were held by a mob called SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies in London. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice if I could go to that place in London and have a look at these little notebooks? And so, as m many of us do these days, there came upon a time when I found myself to be in London. And I thought, oh, I might go along to the SOAS place, School of Oriental and African Studies, and say, can I see your notebooks for William Dawes? So I went there on, um, in 1995 to SOAS, and I called at the front desk and I said, I've come to look at the notebooks of William Dawes. And they said to me, do you have a letter of introduction? I said, I beg your pardon? You need a letter of introduction to come in here, they said. I said, do you? Oh, I don't know, I mean, you don't need one for the Mitchell Library, just go in. Just go anywhere in Australia, just go in. These poems are really funny. And so um, I thought, oh, blow you, you lousy old poems, I'll nick off, you know, wada wada. Um, so I went away. And, uh, and so I thought, I was a bit fed up with the rotten old poems, I must say. And then um, I happened to be in London three years later. And just before leaving, I thought, maybe I'll try again. And at that time, I was an administrator in Sydney University. And um, I went to uh, uh, the professor of Latin, who I happened to know, and I said, um, 
would you write me a letter of introduction? Oh, well, would you provide me with one? And I wrote it for him and uh, sent it to him, and he signed it. This is to introduce Jeremy Steele, da ba ba. And uh, so when I went to SOAS again, they said, have you got your letter of introduction, sir? So I said, oh, I pulled this thing out, and I said, will this do? Oh, yes, they said, that'll be all right, and, and they let me in. So I went in the building and uh, asked somebody else, I said, I'd like to see the notebooks of William Dawes. And they said, um, well, where are they? And I described, and they said, oh, they'll be in uh, the special reserve. And I had to find the special reserve, and I found a little room, you know, kind of part of the library, which was the um, special reserve, the School of Orient and African Studies, and got in there. And I went up to the front desk, and I said, um, I want to see the notebooks of William Dawes. Uh, and they said, what are they? And I said, well, these are notebooks, you know, vocabularies from Sydney, uh, Australia. They said, this is the School of Oriental and African Studies. Nothing to do with Australia. I said, oh, so it is. Good heavens. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, but I said, oh, I think they're here. And I sat down perplexed. And they said, oh, just wait a minute. And about 15 minutes later, they came back and said, they held up a little thing much smaller than this and said, could this be it? A little envelope it was. So I said, I don't know. Anyway, I was able to take it and sat down at a little one of the benches there and opened this envelope. And inside were these two tiny notebooks there. And I thought, wow, look at this. And they were very small, you know, just like very tiny notebooks. And they were the notebooks of William Dawes written in 1790 and 91. I didn't even have to, didn't have to use white gloves or anything like that. I just looked at them. I could have scribbled all over them. Anyway, that was the story. And I eventually looked and I started typing them out. I had a tiny, very ancient computer at the time. Anyway, that's a whole other story. And I couldn't do it. And uh, anyway, I was, uh, never mind. I managed to get a copy later on. And that became uh, part of my database and so on. So that's how the beginnings of the William Dawes story happened for me. And I subsequently did lots and lots of other uh, these databases and they went into the computer and so on. And finally, I mean that went into the Sydney language database and subsequently to that I'd managed to develop ones for north of Sydney, south of Sydney, from the Wiradjuri language mentioned by uh, Jonathan, the Camilleroy also mentioned by him. And these things have tens or thousands upon thousands of records in now and the Murawari language, the Nyunga language of Western Australia, and the Tasmanian database, that's 18,000 words in that, and so on. So that's the end, end of that page. And the word I'd like to, you to remember about this is the word to speak. Baya is the word to speak. And Bayala is to speak reciprocally. That means back and forwards. Bayala is like to converse. What's it? Say the word. Baya. Baya. Thank you. Baya. Speak. All right. Jonathan mentioned something about languages, and that's what I'm going to do now. In Australia, there are 32 language groups. 30, well, these are sort of huge, huge groups of languages, OK? And um, the biggest one by far is called the Palma Nyungan group of languages. And Palma is the word for man in North Queensland. And Nyunga is the word for man in southwest Western Australia. And the Palma Nyungan group of languages covers most of the continent. Most of the continent is this Parmanyunga group. And the other 31 are all up there in the Darwin region, the, in the northwest corner. And I think that might be because wave after wave of people might have come in there from New Guinea uh, at, over different periods and set up these other groups there. But they're all part of the Australian group of languages, and there are no other languages in the world quite like these ones here. Anyway, so that's uh, what we have. Um, in Tasmania, whether that's part of it or not is rather hard to say, but the, in Tasmania there are at least five languages. So that's a separate issue. And there are about 200 language, languages groups in Australia, all forming part of these 32 huge groups that I've mentioned. And of these 250 language, uh, languages in Australia, 20 or so are still in current use. In other words, 230 of them are gone, including the Sydney language, and the Sydney language was number one to disappear. Now, the, um, language, these languages, I want to tell you a little bit about them. The languages, uh, generally speaking, these are broad generalizations, use suffixes, endings on words. In English, we, don't, we have some suffixes. Take the word govern. We have, say, governing. That's a process of govern, governing, with ing on the end. Governed, we, that we did it in the past. And government, you know, the business of governing, and so on. And there may be a few more. So we've got a few, uh, we've got mentoning and ED on the end. And, and there's about five in English we use. Very, very few compared with Aboriginal languages. What English uses, instead of these endings, 
is prepositions. These are the little words at, in, on, above, under, around, all these little words which we use in English all the time. And they are what this bit of paper is on the table. So that is the preposition on, or it is under the table, it is by the table. These are how we in English describe so much, is by these prepositions. But they don't have any prepositions in these Aboriginal languages, especially not the Sydney one. And there are no conjunctions. There are these words and and but we use all the time. They don't bother with those, just don't need them when you think about it, really. So there are none of those. The English language is very keen on word order. We really need to know about word order. It makes a lot of difference if you say man bites dog or dog bites man. You know who's doing the biting by the word order, whether the man is biting the dog or the dog is biting the man. But word, word order is not really important so much in Aboriginal languages because you can tell what's going on by the endings or suffixes which are used on these words. Another distinction between these, in these languages is, in Aboriginal languages, there are few colour names. If you go, to, go to, to a hardware store and buy a tin of paint, you'll find there's endless names of colours there. But, uh, and we've got you know, vermilion and puce and all these things, like and orange and whatnot, shades of this and shades of that, and purple and, and so on. There are very few colour names used in Aboriginal languages, and I'll give you a few of them. You're lucky if you get black, white, red, yellow and green. Sometimes you don't have those. And the words they use for these is very often something that is of that color. Like the word for night may be used as the word for black. Okay. And so on. So that's just another difference. There's um, very few number names as well. We've got all the numbers that you can count up to. But you're very lucky in, a, in Aboriginal languages if you've got two or three. So the word, Sydney language word, and you don't have to remember this one, is wagle for one. Bula is two. And burui is three. But we don't really know any more than that. But I wouldn't mind betting. I, you've, I put this on here. But there are four things on this table here. But I wouldn't mind betting that if the Aboriginal people wanted to say there are four and not five and there's not something else on this table, they could have done it, used words. For example, they could have said, this is two, so that's bula. And this book and this, this bit of paper is also two. So they might have said bula bula for four. They might have. I don't know quite what they did, but that's the sort of way they might have done it. But to count you mob here as 258, or whatever you are, I'm not sure they would have done that. They might have said maridulu, which just means plenty. Okay. So that's um, a little bit about that. Oh, there's no courtesy terms, by the way. No please, no thank you, none of that. No good morning, no good afternoon, none of that stuff. They don't have courtesy terms. Okay. And there are no words for days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They didn't know about days of the week. Now, I just want you to imagine that you are landing on the moon. No, 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 think of the Mars. We've got gone, we've done the moon, Mars. We've, we're in a rocket ship, and we've gone to Mars, all of you, separately in this rocket ship. And the people on Mars, pretty much like us, you know, they, got, um, they, like, they look a bit human, okay, and so on, so pretty well are human, but uh, in there, they're Martians. Never seen mobs from Earth before. And you want to find out their language, learn as much as you can. So what do you do? Well, you point to your head, say, not hat, point to your head, and uh, you, you, you say the word for head, look at them quizzically, and with a bit of luck, they'll say their word for head. So you write down, oh, their word for head is such and such, gabra, Sydney language word for head, gabra, okay? So they write this down, word for head, and then you point to hands and fingers and legs and nose. Uh, there are endless lists of body parts in the or early lists of uh, language recordings all across Australia because it's easy to do. You, you do the body parts. And another thing you can do pretty easily as well is um, uh, words like walk and run and throw and jump. I mean, you can act out these things, okay? And uh, so you can do all of those in words like spear and tree and things like that. You can get these words because you point at them. But it's very hard to get abstract words. Okay, abstract words are very difficult to do because they're very hard to act out. And I'll give you a few of them. Just imagine you wanted to ask this Martian person you're dealing with, what's your word for um, truth? And they'll look at you quizzically and uh, you try and act out the word for truth. Or kindness, or love, or hate, or pleasure, 
knowledge, wisdom. What's your word for wisdom, you say? Well, they'd look. And so you might think that uh, freedom and hope and despair and loyalty, integrity, things like that. How on earth would any people on the first fleet ask Aboriginal people, what's your word for integrity, integrity and hope to get a sense? However, it's not to say they didn't have words for these things. It was just incredibly difficult to ask because you just can't act them out. So they may have had these words, but they're not in any of the word lists I've got from any of these languages. Which is also not to say that the Aboriginal people were kind of uh, lesser than any that, that we are. Um, we might think they were primitive people and so on. You needn't jump to that conclusion. The languages were p perfectly capable of dealing with anything that they needed in their environment. And some things they were more precise about than we are in English. And I'll give you a couple. They are very keen about relationships. We have this loose word, aunt. Pretty loose, really, because you don't know whether your aunt is your mother's sister or your father's sister. But from an Aboriginal point of view, they're quite different sort of categories, your mother's sister and, and your father's sister. Similarly with uncle and similarly with grandfather, you're talking about on your mother's side or your father's side, and we just usually, loosely say aunt, uncle, and grandfather. But they needed it absolutely because they needed to know who they could have relations with. And so the whole business about relationships in Aboriginal um, societies is very, very particular. And so they were very, very specific about these things, but the records for the Sydney language are not good in this particular area. They had another thing that they were very specific about, which we, are, we don't care about at all in English, which I have alluded to here, which is the we. We here are sitting on the grass. We here, but not that mob over there. Okay. <clears throat> so they had an idea of inclusive and exclusive when they talk about it. We, and the, we too, if him and I over here, I could say we too are on this side, of this uh, bit of grass here, and you lot are on the other side. So we two are on this side. And there's a difference between we two and we all. All of us make we all, but we two is just him and me, okay? And so the, the Aboriginal languages are very particular. They're very particular about we two or we all, and we two excluding you, or we two excluding you, you mob. Okay, that's we all. Okay, got that? So that uh, that's one of the... the really specific things where they are, Aboriginal languages are more precise than in English. Well, the um, Aboriginal, the Sydney language was the first one to be overwhelmed and lost in about 1825, as I mentioned. And I just wanted to mention one or two things about this language uh, also. So they have pronouns. We all have pronouns, but they have different kind of pronouns. They have what's called a free pronoun, which was what, what we have in English. I, you, he, she, they, these are words that stand by themselves. And they had, the word for I is Ngaya, say it. Now I might ask you now, what was the word for you? You're gonna fail this exam rather badly. Nyini, remember that? Nyini, Nyini was you, just one of you, Nyini. Ngaya is I, Nyini, okay. But they also had bound pronouns, which is rather like in Latin. Am I bow, am I bass, am I bat, am I vamos, am I bat. Do you remember that from your Latin studies? I wonder if any of you do. Anyway, that's uh, to love in Latin. And that was I love, you love, he loves, we love, you love, they love, and so on. So the same sort of thing applies in the Sydney language. You can have these pronouns on the back of these words. So you can have them either attached, bound pronouns, or separately like ngaya and nyini. Well... Sydney language also has connections with nearby languages like the Awabakal language on the Hunter River and the Gundungara language in the mountains and, uh, and so on, the Wiradjuri. You'll find some words are the same or similar in both these. But uh, most, of the languages, most of the words are different, so you can't. They are, they are mutually non-comprehensible. There are traces of the Sydney language in English to this day. I wonder if you know them. I shall try one or two words on them, on you, and see if you know these words. Dingo. I think I'm sure you all know dingo. It's the word for dog. Waratah. You all know what a waratah is. It's a pretty flower. We have the waratah. I don't know if you know waddy, but uh, it used to be in the language. It means a stick or a club, a waddy. Another one you'll all know is koala. 
actually the word was gula, but uh, koala. I see a dingo over there now. Look, that one. Uh, there you go. That's a dog. And uh, wallaby, wombat, woomera. A woomera. Woomera is the word for run. Run like an animal or fly like a bird. Woomera. Woomera. So that's that. And, of course, place names are all around us, though we don't often know the meanings of them. And I'll run through one of these place names that you will know around the Sydney suburbs. Camaray. You know Caraba Road. Caraba Road in, in uh, just on the North Shore there. Uh, Parramatta, Chalora, Toon Gabby, Tugra, that Tugra's on the way to Newcastle, Cowan, Cooliwong. That's a, do you know Cooliwong? That's on the way to Newcastle as well, it's on the train line. Mount Kola, Woi Woi, Warunga, Warawi, Taramara, Wandabine, Barara, Wyong, Yaguno, Birong, Turella, Nawi. Nawi is a suburb um, of, of Sydney, which it means canoe. Mariong means emu, Warimu. Bulabara is in the Blue Mountains, which probably means two kangaroos. Katoomba, Yonora, possibly something to do with going. Cabramatta. Cabramatta is the, uh, Cabra was a, was Gabra, was a grub that they ate. So it's probably the place of this grub that they ate. Minangal, we don't know. Mulgoa means swan. Mount Koala is Mount, Mount Koala. Ka Karaba of, of Karaba Road. Karaba is the prong of the multi-pronged fishing spear. I want you to remember that of this lot, Ngaya, which is a word for I. Not the word for I that you look through, it's I, me. The word that you look for, for I that you see with is meal. Okay? Badabao is I eat, and Badabami is you will eat. The last thing is the, well, is the end of this funny story is the reawakening of the language. And you're all doing it partly here, if you've remembered any of these words I said. There is a program going on at Chifley College on the Dunhevard campus in Sydney, in Mount Druitt. I have nothing to do with that. And it's a very good program, as far as I know. And they're teaching it in schools. The only thing I know about is a little bit of an effort I've been running in Redfern, with the Redfern community. And I'm talking about tiny numbers here. And that's why I mentioned 250 in the beginning, well, four. I'm lucky if four turn up at my little show in Redfern. And uh, so that's quite good. And we pass on to them week by week on a Friday a little bit about the Sydney language. But, and it's rather disappointing that so few turn up. But the interesting thing is that some of the uh, people that are there, they then represent this information which I've been giving them to the primary school kids. And they usually get 25 to 30 of the primary school kids. And that is the best group to try and transmit language to because they're the ones who remember it, they learn it fast, and they're full of enthusiasm and so on. So that the uh, Redfern language sessions are then being transmitted sort of again to the primary school kids. And, uh, and that's uh, about all I want to say to you today. I could have done a bit more, but we can now go on to this exam if you're ready for it. Now we just do it. We just got this, this little page here. There's the exam page. Now I want to see if you can remember what Ngura meant. Camp. Country, place, Ngura. Nini. Nini was, yes, thank you. You, you singular. Nini, you singular. All right. Yagu. Yagu. We've got this suburb in Sydney called Yaguna. Yagu. It means now or today. Yagu. Bial. Remember when I mentioned that one? Bial. It meant no. I don't hear you say no. Thank you. Well, interestingly enough, m many Aboriginal languages, not all of them, but are based on the word they use for no. We heard Jonathan talking about Wiradjuri and Camilleroy. Guess what the word for no is in Wiradjuri? It's Wira. And the word for no in Camilleroy is Gamil. And the Aroi, Arai in those two words is the suffix or ending meaning having. So Wiradjuri means having Wira. We're the mob that has Wira in brackets for no. And Gamilaroi is, the Aroi is having, we're the mob that has Gamil for no. So quite a few of these languages have this no with having, and the other way they do it is saying it twice. And so myself and Keith Smith, who will be here tomorrow, have given the name to a Sydney language because no, one, no name was ever recorded for it, Bial Bial. Said it twice, Bial Bial. It, this is an invention and of no authority, and you can decry it if you like. Anyway, there you go. Galgala. Remember what I said Galgala was? Smallpox. Galgala. Ka Kadigal. You'll all know Kadigal. They're the mob that were here. That went from 
South Head to Darling Harbour. Beyond Darling Harbour is the Wongol mob. Wong Gull, by the way, means mob, group of people. So the Gadigal people are the mob of Gadi. Gadi is a place on in Watson's, Watson's Bay. And the Gadigal people extended from basically Watson Bay from South Head to Darling Harbour, and the Wan people went from there as far as Parramatta. And the Wangal people is what their name was, and Benelong was a Wangal man. On the north shore, you had the Walimedigal, uh, opposite the Wangal, and the Gamaragal, the Camaragal, opposite uh, the, uh, the Gadigal on the north shore. Baya, or Bayala, Baya was to speak. Did anybody remember that? No, oh dear, oh dear, dear, oh dear. Baya was to, the lap part is the reciprocal uh, on it to say you speak. Ngaya, come on, come on. Ngaya meant I, I think I heard someone say I. Ngaya is I, I, that's me. Ngaya is I. Bada bao, I don't expect you to remember that one. That is I will eat. And bada bami, so bada bao, bada bami, the wu on the end is I, and the me, bada bami, is thou, or you will eat. Oh, I, I didn't mention this one. Dalang is the word for tongue or language. Dalang. But I did mention at the front about muru. Anybody remember? Oh, yes. Path. Well done. Path. Muru is path. Bimal. You weren't you first to listen. Bimal was what you're sitting on. It is the earth. Bimal, like Pemawi. Bimal. Bimal. Only two more. Bamuru. It's very close to path, the ground. Bimal. Grass. Bamuru. And the last one of all, Badu. Yes. Well, there you go. Well, you got about 15% out of that exam. You did not too badly. And so thank you very much. And uh, I'm honored to be here. And you've a great audience. Thank you. Oh, I'm supposed to. Thank you. I'm supposed to stay for questions. If you want to ask anything, um, it's all in my computer behind me here. And uh, some of it's in my head, not much. Yes. Thanks, Jeremy. Good to see you again. I'm a, I'm a mathematician. I love the counting yeah. system. Yeah. The computer has got two numbers, zero and one. It can count all the numbers of the stars. Yeah. Yeah. The Aboriginal people had a base yeah. three or a base five. That's yeah. documented in books by John Rudder uh, all right. and people, and it is documented in the board of studies. So I just do uh, do take some exception to the to people who say that um, they only could count up to three or four. There's, uh, there's 360 days from the year for them, and for us, there's, there's 30 days in a month, and they I think he's absolutely right, and um, this is what I tried to present when I did that bottles and paper on the table. That, uh, in my view, that they could do it. They could, they could do it. I, 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 this is what I imagine, and I think he's confirming it here. That um, they would be able to tell you. I don't know about this 257 that, or however many you are here. You think they could? I'm not. You think so? Yes. Hey, he, he's con he's convinced. Look. I, he knows far more about that aspect of it than I do, but so he's probably right. But um, so I don't think uh, they gave up on two or three, really. I think they were able to do it much better than that. So thank you, sir. That, that's great. Yeah. Anyone else? I'm just wondering, do you have any idea how the smallpox got here? If the oh. white people were infected with it, right? Like, it does make me wonder if it was deliberately introduced or not. Well, there's been many theories about that, and uh, nobody really knows. But um, they definitely brought some stuff out on the first fleet in, in bottles. Um, and uh, whether it was released deliberately, it is certainly a theory that it was. There is some theory also that it was uh, actually in um, way up in Darwin and somehow transmitted itself across the country. I think that's pretty unlikely myself. I spoke to the professor of infectious diseases at Sydney University at one time, and she said um, she thought it might have been uh, passed uh, from one to one by the, they see all these blankets on the ground, they distributed blankets. That was one of the sort of benevolent things that they did in the early days, had blanket distributions once a year, and they gave out blankets to the Aboriginal people, and maybe these blankets were inadvertently, conceivably, deliberately, um, infected with the smallpox. So, no, I don't know the answer. All I can say is there are theories about it, and, um, and it's a very, very tragic story. I 
uh, Jeremy, two questions yeah. about the Dawes notebooks. Uh, one, uh, I believe he picked up a lot of his knowledge from his uh, intimate relationship with Patya Garan. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, as a result, whether there are lots of uh, some of the uh, notions that you said were very hard to interpret, uh, yeah. right. emotional uh, words. And the second question is, uh, I've been trying to track down a uh, publication of the notebooks for a long time, and I'm wondering whether you have any hints as to how I might uh, achieve getting a hold of a copy. I'm told they were reprinted recently. Well, answer that second part. Um, they're online. While I had to go to London to see these darn things and get the, got them with immense difficulty, they are now online and beautiful copies. Uh, which I can give you the reference to afterwards, that would be fine. So any of you can uh, see these things. On. In fact, actually, if you type in Dawes Notebooks into Google, I think that you'll probably find that straight away. That's probably all you need to do. And uh, you can see them page by page, beautiful, beautiful copies of these notebooks. So, so that's absolutely wonderful. Um, the intimate um, uh, references, and Pachigarang, of course. Pachigarang, by the way, is the word for kangaroo. Uh, uh, Pachigarang um, was the young teenage girl who um, appears to have stayed uh, at Dawes' house. Of course, in those days, people wore no clothes. Um, and so Dawes was anxious that Pachigarang should put her clothes on and so on. Dawes was a very prudish man. Um, but he was a red corpuscle bloke, I suppose. And so who knows what went on there? No, we don't know that side of it. I think well of Dawes. Um, so I don't know what he got up to there. But uh, one of the s sentences in the Dawes notebooks is, shall we sleep separate? Um, that's one of the sentences recorded. And it rather implies sleeping together. <laughs> By, you know, if you have the sentence, shall we sleep separate? And so on. So um, that's one of the... Another one was when they were standing in front of the fire. And, and she was... Dawes was urging her to put the clothes on. And she says, um, Gorod, you... What was it? I get uh, yeah, Dagada, I think. Anyway, I get to, she, she, she's getting more warmth from the fire, standing in front of the fire with no clothes. We all know this. If you stand in front of the fire with no clothes on, you get the warmth of it from the uh, fire, but when you put clothes on, it sort of stops the warmth coming through. And that was the sentences, sentence that uh, Pachigrang used. So the, you got, I got this image of the hut with Pachigrang in it unclad and so on but um, in terms of any misbehavior I don't know he was regarded as a very upright man and so we just really don't know any other questions I think we might wrap it up there I, w I was keen also just to do a bit of promotion for you but if anyone wants to follow the work that Jeremy's doing you have your website oh. available could you just let us know that website because people might want to well it's it's Aboriginal language is one word Aboriginal languages one word dot com and uh, you can just type that in and you'll find uh, various things there including every single session I've run at um, Redfern.